enough for a quorum, Ken? We're good to go? Yep, whenever you're ready. Thank you. Call to order. Do we have any alternates with us this evening? Not that I'm seeing on the list. If there's any on the call, uh, you can identify yourself. That'd be helpful. Okay, we'll move ahead to consideration approval of the meeting minutes. To make a motion to approve those last minutes, please. So moved by Turner. All those in favor say aye. 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 Motion carries. Is there anyone uh, wishing to utilize the time for public discussion of any item not on the agenda? Okay. Update on the final Crandic passenger rail and rails to trails study. I think we have an individual presenting, Ken. Yeah, we do. Uh, I'll go ahead and just give a real brief update before we uh, turn it over to uh, our guests. Uh, I'm Kent Ralston. I'm the executive director. Uh, thanks everyone for coming. Um, as I think all of you know now, uh, we've been working on a passenger rail study and a trail study, kind of an auxiliary trail study now for a number of years uh, with Iowa DOT, Crandic, uh, and the MPO, uh, as well as our, our communities, of course and then our consultant being uh, HDR. Um, it was a three-phase study, uh, and the third and final phase uh, was just completed here uh, several months ago. Um, as you'll remember, the study basically looked at the, the potential for passenger rail between Penn Street, North Liberty, and uh, Gilbert Street uh, in Iowa City. Um, the intent of the phase three study was to focus on ridership, revenue forecasts, and financial strategies. Uh, and I did want to mention that as far as the ridership forecasts go, we did uh, get that done in a method that we can use later for a grant, either to the Federal Rail, Rail Administration or Federal Transit Administration. And that was important uh, to our phase three study. Um, we had a stakeholder presentation back on July 17th of 20 uh, with representatives from Crandic, Iowa DOT, the University of Iowa, and of course, all of our member communities. And uh, with us, and in your memo, I did include some highlights of the study, uh, but I won't go through those now. Uh, with us this evening is Jeff Woods. He's the Director of Business Development with Cranick Railroad. Uh, I see that Anthony Clowman is on the call. He was an uh, engineer that worked on the study with HDR. And also Amanda Martin uh, with the Rail Office at the Iowa DOT is also here uh, this evening to give us a quick presentation of the Phase 3 study. Um, at this point, uh, Jeff, if you're on the line, we have the PowerPoint ready and uh, we can either let you uh, run the show and run your screen or we're able to pull that up for you, whichever makes it easier. You know what, I'm going to, uh, Kent, I've been having some bandwidth issues today, so I'm going to let you drive it and then I'll just uh, say let's click along. That's okay. Fantastic. We'll see if we can't get it pulled up here real quickly. And I want to apologize in uh, advance for my pesky golden doodle that one doesn't know if he wants in the house or out of the house. So if you see me reaching over, I've got my screen shut off for that reason. <laughs> but uh, yeah, um, I can't see the PowerPoint. There it comes. Thank you. First of all, I just want to thank everybody for their uh, time and involvement in this project. Ken did a great job introducing it. I know you got a busy night tonight, so I won't uh, uh, take up too much of your time with introductions and background on it. But this was a presentation we gave to folks back in July. It's a real high overlook at the project that we've been uh, considering for the last uh, four plus years, I think it is now. And uh, Tony Kwaman with HDR is on the line, can answer any technical questions. Moving to the next slide, um, you know, really, uh, this is the, the outline of what we're going to go over. I'm not going to cover a lot of details. I really want to hit the high points because from my perspective, uh, you know, we can all read through the detailed reports, but I think it, it ultimately gets to a point of, you know, what's next? Is this something we want to pursue? Is this something, uh, maybe it's not the right time? 
uh, and just kind of have that dialogue. And I, I realize this evening is probably not going to be the time that that happens. Um, but as background on the study, um, next slide, please. I'm sorry. Next slide, please. You know, really what we uh, started to look at was the old Cranach line between Cedar Rapids and Iowa City, which I think this group probably realizes was founded as a passenger rail back in the early 1900s, operated that way for about 50 years. And we looked at the whole thing. Then we looked at uh, from Iowa City to North Liberty. And then I think Kent did a really good job of, of approaching the group and saying, look, you know, I don't want to do study after study after study. I really want to kind of get to the end game, if that makes sense. And I totally agreed with that concept, as did our good friends at the Iowa Department of Transportation. And I think the two things on the phase three study that I really want to point out are, was it did model the UI student travel, and it also brought in a realistic service plan. So the service plan that we went in with uh, isn't what the study actually produced. This provided a model which actually drove engagement from the community to use the service. So I think as we get into that, that's just one important notation that I want to make. Moving to the next slide, um, you know, these are the participants. It was all of you. Um, again, we thank you for um, all of your time and, and resources that you put into this. Uh, moving to the next slide, uh, you know, the rail line, I think Amanda might make a couple comments when we get to the question aspects of this. But one of the unique aspects that we have uh, in the corridor area is the existing right of way that's there and its location. So we don't have to do any eminent domain. We don't have to do any abandonment. We don't have to do a lot of things that take up a lot of time and utilize a lot of scarce resources. And in this case, Cranick as a, a, a cooperative railroad partner is unique. Many of these discussions take place on dense freight corridors in metropolitan areas and frankly the class one railroads and rightfully so I guess from the railroader perspective in me don't want to give that up for passenger service but it solves a lot of the basic equations and overcomes a lot of the very um, costly and time-consuming hurdles that many of these projects run into. I think the other thing that we just want to note again is that the ridership service on the line takes into accommodation everything that that it needs to get done. It takes in where the stations are at, the equipment that we use, the crossings to provide safety, the signalizations to provide safety, and it utilize, utilizes existing bridges, tracks, and things that are just there today. So it, it is a unique opportunity in the United States. I'll let Amanda talk about that a little bit uh, as the dialogue moves forward. Moving to the next slide, um, the service plan, what we found out through HDR's good work and the surveys that were done um, was, you know, if we could operate 30 minutes one way from Dubuque Street to Penn Street, that was attractive to people. If we can do it seven days a week, 6 a.m. to 7 p.m., that was fabulous. You can see the, the transit times from certain stations, uh, bus compared to rail under the plan that is there, um, is really designed to accommodate growth. And the one thing that we did decide early on uh, was let's not really worry about who operates the service for now, how it's financed. Let's just say what would it take to get what we think is a, is a nice level of participation from the community in using it. Um, so we've got competitive times compared to roadway traffic, at least on the bus side of it. And then the rail has amenities where with, you know, parking, if you're close to it, where you can walk or, or ride a bike. And whatnot. We'll talk a little bit more about that in some of the upcoming slides. Next slide, please. The equipment that we have uh, contemplated in this is what's called diesel multiple unit rail cars. So these are self-propelled, you know, they meet all the government regulations. We would put uh, one unit on each end so it would operate in a push-pull service. So, you know, really, uh, if you think about one coming north, pulls it uh, at the end. Somebody goes to the other end and, and drives south. Uh, I, for me, the important part of this is that uh, it has seating capacity for 150 to 175 people on average. And uh, the one thing that I would note is if this did move forward, there are opportunities in the marketplace. And we didn't put a whole lot into this yet, predicated on how our dialogue goes, to explore green. There's CNG, LNG. Uh, electric gets to be a little bit expensive, but uh, that is something else that we consider. So um, 
there are options out there, but the base premise was using the diesel, diesel multiple units, which is used in other locations around the United States. Next slide, please. Uh, the stations are, uh, you know, just efficient stations. They're not overly fancy. They are ADA compliant. Um, they've got canopies, single facing, lighting, uh, lighting all the signage, uh, the ticket machines and, and, and whatnot. But it's not, uh, you know, it's not Grand Central Station in downtown Chicago by any stretch, but it's certainly functional and would work for the clientele that uh, we think would be interested in using the service itself. Next slide, please. This was interesting, um, and I will let Tony get into the details if anybody has questions, but based on the initial modeling, uh, 2019 year, um, we forecast that we could have 1.4 million passengers use the service. Now, I didn't really know in my perspective what that means, and the, the easiest comparison that I wanted to, to use was, well, what's the Eastern Iowa Airport do? And they do 1.3 million passengers a year. So uh, to me, that's a significant number. And it's showing significant growth in the next eight years to where it gets up to 1.8 million passengers a year. And I will let Tony go into this matrix and explain some of it uh, at the end if uh, there are questions about that. But that's a lot of people riding the, the trackage between uh, North Liberty and Iowa City, and particularly as you get down into the uh, Coralville, Iowa City area. Next slide, please. So the nuts and bolts, I'm sure this is the one that everybody's really interested in. Uh, up front, uh, we're probably looking at $55 million in 2019, 2020 dollars. Um, over time, that will go up, nothing's getting cheaper. Uh, it's a little bit of an increase from what we talked about early on, but that is to meet and, and match up with what the market wants in terms of transit times. So it, it kind of is what it is. Uh, the numbers on the right are the estimated annual cost to provide the service, and we used assumed railroad-like costs. So prevailing wages with railway um, operators, which is probably not the scenario that this works on, but um, 4.8 million annual uh, based on the ridership fare in peer groups around the country, which again, I can let Tony talk about. So we looked at other markets and what they charge for this uh, and came up with a 44% fare, uh, fare recovery rate. Um, it does leave you with a $2.7 million spread. So, you know, there are opportunities to, can you charge more on the, on the fare, can you lower your costs uh, for ongoing annual uh, operations and maintenance? But we wanted to put out there a, a, a number that wasn't a unicorn type solution and then and just look at the facts. Uh, and the capital uh, by uh, various uh, categories is broken down. Next slide, please. Um, Brad and Kent had asked us, could we uh, really look at some of the beneficial impacts um, you know, I've had the ability to ride the system that's in Denver. Uh, my sister rides the one in Portland, Oregon quite a bit. And, uh, you know, it's interesting as I'm on these, there are a lot of social impacts in terms of quality of life, just connectivity. Um, you know, in Denver, the one that I rode from uh, downtown out to Parker, which is south, it's really interesting because at every station, it's become its own community. It's almost like a replica of what happened with the Cranick a hundred years ago, where you know one of the bigger stops was a little town called Swisher, and it became a community. And then North Liberty became a community. Um, so uh, it, it's almost replicating it on a different scale. So you know you see five to seven story high rise communities with coffee shops and restaurants within a couple three blocks of these uh, stations that uh, pop up, and it's really just a, a great amenity. Uh, for communities to offer um, its citizens and, and people that are thinking about coming there, let alone that you're taking a lot of cars off the road, you're reducing fuel use and congestion and maintenance on the highway system. Next slide, please. There's a lot of uh, economic benefits, we think. Um, communities that uh, have Install these types of things, have these benefits. I, I don't need to go through them line by line. Um, you're familiar with 
what all of those mean. Uh, but it has been a, a formula for uh, a growth and and uh, retention of good jobs and good people in, in other locations around the country. So very positive impacts that way. When it comes to funding sources and options, um, you know, the, the group studied several different things. Uh, there are public funds out there. There are grants and capital expenditure programs uh, that are available through small starts and new starts. And it's a changing environment in that world. Um, you know, that was the one thing that phase three did get us to. It was we wanted to really get something that was quote unquote grant ready. If the group decided it was something that it wanted to pursue, um, let's, let's, let's get to the end game now. Uh, we do think there's opportunities for public private partnerships. Uh, in Detroit, for example, we've talked with a, a couple different people that have told us in Detroit, there were actually private investors that came in and, and looked at where the line was going to be. Um, and it's not a very long line and private investors said, well, I'd like to invest, but I'm gonna buy uh, land around the station here. And uh, you know, I'm willing to throw some money at it there. There's also opportunities for private funding. And uh, you know, there's lead agencies and, and governance that can take place. So lots of options on that front, but uh, to the team, it was more of that's, uh, let's talk about that later if it's something that the, the group is interested in. So with that, Amanda, maybe we just wanna throw in a couple comments from the DOT's perspective on um, how you see the project and what you've seen in other locations. Yes, yes. Um, thanks for having me today. just wanted to um, bring up a few things that from my perspective, I'm the Freight and Passenger Policy Coordinator at the Iowa DOT out of Ames. Um, I work with both freight and passenger rail, so I see both perspectives of corridors that are being utilized for different types of things. I work on the Moline to Iowa City project for passenger rail that we're trying to get moving forward as well. So I look at it from not only commuter rail, light rail types of things, but also um, inner city passenger rail and long distance service throughout the state. So. Some of the things that I've noticed and recognized as part of this project is one, we have an amazing partner, Crandic, um, which you guys are really lucky to have in your community. Not only do they provide a great um, regional railroad opportunity, which provides a lot of economic development and um, connectivity solutions with the class one railroads, but it also, they were the ones that came to the table and brought this project to us or brought this concept to us. I know this has been studied before and I know that there was numbers that didn't work well before, um, but we decided, you know, when Cranick came to us and said, hey, you know, we want to look at this corridor again because we're not utilizing it for the freight service that we once did. Um, we want to see if it's potentially something that could be utilized for passenger service. We know you guys are making improvements on the 380 corridor and we know that there's going to be a lot more congestion in the future based on projections of freight traffic. And there's a lot of commuters that need to get between those two communities and the dynamics of those two communities or multiple communities have changed a lot over the years. Um, you know, what do you think about studying this for the feasibility of some sort of passenger rail effort? And we were like, yeah, that makes total sense. And so, you know, us and the MPOJC and Crandic, we got together. Um, we've provided funding for these uh, phase studies, as you're well aware. And the thing that I want to point out is that this does not happen. You don't get um, passenger rail opportunities through a freight railroad company. Um, like Jeff mentioned, freight railroads typically are trying to make money with freight railroad types of activities. And corridors, you know, a lot of corridors were abandoned many years ago, and a lot of people wish they could go back and get those corridors again because the dynamics have changed. You know, demographics have changed. Um, communities have, have um, maybe died off and other ones have risen up. And so, you know, folks go back to the drawing board again, there's probably a lot of abandoned railroads that they probably wouldn't have abandoned or they would have um, maybe kept on hold of for a little bit longer to see what would have happened. And so when a freight railroad comes to us and says, hey, we wanna look at passenger rail, we're like, yes, that makes total sense. We really, um, we really wanna look at this. And so as Jeff um, described, this railroad corridor was actually originally developed for passenger efforts. And so it's a perfect corridor, corridor because what we run into with other passenger rail 
efforts that we're trying to introduce is you've got a lot of at-grade crossings. And at-grade crossings obviously um, can cause a lot of issues because you have interaction with um, the traveling public. And so we know that when we look at this corridor, there's not that many at-grade crossings. So not only was it designed in a perfect location to go through the downtown of Iowa City, and we know what's happened with the um, university and all the things associated with the medical part of the university. Um, it's also, you know, it's it's, um, it's it's perfect location. There's very few grade at grade um, crossings, and the communities have just built around that particular corridor. And so, you know, when they brought that to our attention and wanted to study it, we were like, yes, let's do this. So. Um, what I've had the opportunity to do is talk to others over the years as we've been developing these studies. I've talked to other folks in other states that I work with on passenger rail projects and I've explained to them that this is an effort that we have going on and that with the passenger rail or the freight railroad was the one that actually brought it to our attention and their mouths just dropped. They're just shocked that a freight railroad is actually interested in proposing a corridor for passenger rail, a corridor that they currently own and um, operate on. And so, you know, it really is a unique opportunity and Cranick has been a great partner. The other part of this that I want to mention is we do frequently, and it hasn't happened um, as much historically, but recently we've get, been getting a lot of, a lot more interest in folks wanting to know if there was, would be an opportunity to get some sort of commuter light rail type of thing between Des Moines, Ankeny and Ames. Um, as you're probably well aware, they have a similar sort of situation there. Um, those communities are paralleled with a very busy interstate system. There's lots of freight traffic. There's a lot more commuter traffic that's going between the communities because the communities have um, gotten much bigger over the years, especially Ankeny. And so when we look at that corridor, after folks mention it to us and kind of inquire about it, we look at that corridor, most of that um, corridor, rail corridor that was previously there has been abandoned. And as Jeff mentioned, you know, that's a whole different situation when something's been abandoned. Um, it's just not cheap. It's not easy. It's not cheap. There's a lot of um, different steps that have to be taken if you wanted to, to acquire that land again. And it's, um, there's, it's just a big hurdle and sometimes it's an impossible hurdle. So with you guys, you guys already have a corridor, you have a willing partner, Crandic, and now you have a study. So um, I just want to mention that because that's that's something that we um, don't see throughout the state. This is a very unique opportunity and there's a lot of um, good aspects to this corridor as it relates to potentially moving forward with some sort of passenger rail effort. Um, and then Jeff mentioned briefly about the economic development opportunity. I have had the opportunity um, in the last 11 years that I've been in the rail bureau to um, ride a lot of commuter rail and light rail systems, Detroit being one of them. And um, there is a lot of economic development that occurs. Obviously, there's each system is very unique. And so it's kind of hard to compare the systems um, apples to apples. They just really are kind of all unique in, in the way that you can't compare them that way. But what I do, the common denominator that I see is there's a lot of economic development and opportunity that typically arises. Um, and it's, it's kind of an unknown, um, but it is pretty much if this corridor is there, there's going to be economic development. So obviously there'll be opportunities to talk to others um, if this is something that the communities are interested in moving forward with. And I have plenty of contacts that we can um, talk to about those types of things as well. That's pretty much all I wanted to mention, but thanks for the time that you've given me. So, so thanks everyone, that was a great presentation. Um, for the board members, obviously we've got the experts here. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, I know that's a lot to take in. We've talked about it over a number of years, but it's, it's sort of come to this culmination at this point. Um, before, we, before we do get to any questions, I would just add that you know the goal of tonight's presentation was obviously to get this in front of the board, um, sort of close this chapter, at least with respect to the studies being done and, 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 and available to us all. Um, but the goal really was just to get this in front of you and, uh, you know, for those familiar with the MPO, we, we consider ourselves to be sort of consultants for all your 
uh, respective groups, you know, respective communities. It's the easiest way we can explain what it is that we do here. Um, we don't really advocate and push for things without the board wanting us to advocate and push for things. That's sort of the way it works here. So the way I see this is, uh, you know, for something like this to move forward, it obviously needs a champion. Um, with all due respect, we haven't really heard anyone that wants to jump out and, and really push this uh, forward, but that's what it's obviously going to take. Um, I will just mention a few things before we get to any questions is that, you know, when you look at the 50 some odd million dollars and uh, a couple million dollars left over in operating uh, expenses every year, it, it, it sounds like a tremendous amount of money and it certainly is. Uh, but in the transportation world, uh, when you compare it to things like the 8380 interchange that are in the you know 350 to 400 million dollar uh, price tag, it really puts things in perspective that this really isn't all that expensive with respect to transportation projects. Uh, so I'll just throw that out there. Um, I I did also want to mention that we had, and some of you on the call may have had the same opportunity to actually ride the rail uh, a couple years ago. We put together a ride and until you actually get on the, the rail line and actually see where it goes and where it stops, uh, how scenic it is for one thing, following part of the river, and how it really traverses right through the hearts of all our communities, uh, it's hard to exactly grasp how important of, of corridor this is for the community. So whether it uh, becomes a passenger rail you know, in, in the near future, whether this is something that happens in 20, 30, 40 years, um, I really do think it's an opportunity like Amanda was just mentioning that uh, most communities don't have. So with that, I'll leave it to any questions uh, that you all have for, uh, for the group. Questions? Um, this is Lisa Green Douglas. I was wondering on, um, there are certain metrics that are kind of hard to look at because it's measuring things that don't happen. So you would be um, for benefit. Like you would be measuring, um, in a way, the number of cars that don't get out on the road, um, the commuter um, days and all of that. So, and the time and money is time. So I was wondering if, um, and I, I see those as absolute pluses for um, continuing forward with this, but I was wondering, um, especially the Iowa City people, if they could talk about this in regard to how it would help them to um, reach some of the goals of their climate change plan, if it does, in fact, do that. Other comments? Well, I would, Lisa, in response to John Thomas with Iowa City, uh, I think clearly, um, at least from my standpoint, introducing a regional rail system into Iowa City, especially right into the downtown, would certainly provide a, a really outstanding alternative uh, to single occupancy vehicles running back and forth between North Liberty, Coralville, and Iowa City. Uh, so I, I do think it, it would have certainly um, climate benefits as well as just providing a corridor on which uh, development could be organized uh, with a more kind of urban emphasis, transit-oriented type development, which also would have a climate benefit because the densities would be higher. Um, so, and then as, as Kent was saying, it is, it's an interesting corridor as well as being whole as a corridor, which I hadn't appreciated how, that, how unique that is. It, it is kind of an interesting ride because it sort of gets you into a completely different series of uh, experiences that you don't see from any other perspective. So it, it's really, uh, it almost has, at least for me, kind of a tourist quality. It's sort of a, a new way of seeing where you live um, and introduces things in a, in a from a different perspective, which I think is uh, itself a benefit. Thank you. Uh, Pauline Taylor with Iowa City. Um, it, it certainly has been a long time uh, coming to fruition on this, and and with with this phase, we're certainly a lot closer to that. And 
and I'm excited about it. I, I hope it's not 20 to 30 years. I hope it's much sooner than that. I did have just a um, couple of quick questions uh, because I think this would be particularly attractive to uh, those folks who live in North Liberty but work in Iowa City, particularly uh, with my healthcare background, knowing a lot of folks I used to work with that were from there. Uh, but I was concerned about the hours, the, the six o'clock time. Many of those healthcare folks um, have a seven o'clock start time, 7 a.m. And I wasn't sure that they'd be able to get back and back and forth in time, get into work on time uh, for a seven o'clock shift. Uh, and likewise, if they did a 12 hour shift, 7 a.m. to 7 p.m., if it stops at 7 p.m., uh, they wouldn't be able to get back home on that same route. So I just kind of had those questions as far as uh, how the start and stop times were determined, if that's flexible, if we could work on that. Because um, I think it would be a great opportunity, uh, especially with uh, the commuter uh, cost of parking uh, for the hospital and the university uh, to employees is, is it's phenomenal. And I think $1.50, I think was quoted in here for the cost. And so $3 a day uh, would be really reasonable. And I think it'd be attractive to those folks. So back to my original question, as far as how the times were determined and if we would, could be flexible on that. Hello, this is Tony Klaman with HDR. Uh, thanks for having me on this uh, the meeting. Um, we, we did just pick a representative time we thought would work for most uh, people that would want to use the service. I think that's flexible. And uh, given how we assign the, the, the crew uh, to those two train sets as well, uh, we would require multiple cr crews throughout the day for hours of service, that sort of safety factor. Um, uh, it, those hours could be extended, but I think the demand would, you know, likely fall off, you know, toward earlier hours or the later hours. So it's not a sticking point, I think, from future uh, studies or a future look at that. Um, and yeah, I, you know, when we do go to that step, it, it would be interesting to see who would be interested in using a service before 6 a.m. or after 7 p.m. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You're welcome. I also wanted um, to come this is, oh, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, this is Lisa again. Um, in regard to that last comment, I think there there is a group currently studying the um, demand for um, second shift, second and third shift transit, and um, Sunday service. Mm -hmm. And so I, I'm I'm pretty sure that there would be some sort of demand. I don't know if it would be concentrated enough in one place for it to warrant. Um, this sort of transit, but I, I know that there are those needs. And what do you think, or how do we go from here? Is there some way that we can get it into the newspapers, or at least into a public forum presentation to see where folks in the area are at, if they want to pursue it or not pursue it, because more or the other, they're going to have to pay for it. Yeah, so that's a good question, sir. How do we proceed from here? And, and you know, do we start to push this out to the public? I mean, clearly this is a public meeting, and, and of course the media will likely pick up on this uh, anyway, I would think. But yeah, so that goes to my comment earlier about, you know, really, um, if this is something we want to push to the public and something we really want to keep the ball rolling on, uh, you know, as far as the MPO goes, you know, I certainly take my cues from you all and, and from your respective groups. Um, I won't do anything unless I hear from, from this board, you know, that says, yes, we want to proceed, we want to do X, Y, and Z. Uh, to your point, Mayor, something we certainly could do is start to promote this with some uh, presentations. You know, I mean, that's one way just to get this out to the public if, if the board, or, in, or for that matter, any individual community wanted us to come and give a presentation or, um, you know, put together a video or some promotional materials. We, we certainly can do that. Uh, but like I say, we just, we don't, we don't usually go rogue and, and, and do those things without the, the board's permission, so to speak. Um, and certainly with this one, since it takes so many different communities uh, to be involved and, and if we're going to see this project through, um, I would just take my cues from you all. I think the next thing I would obviously say, I guess, is what we've talked about in the past is just making sure that you're all talking to your constituents to see what they all want. Um, you know, you represent uh, varying degrees of your councils uh, based on populations. So 
you know, most of Iowa City, of course, is, is on our board. Uh, but for some of the smaller communities, uh, you know, you don't have a large representation on this board. So it's going to be important to, to go back and talk to your folks and see what they think as well. Um, again, with the price tag, you know, I, I won't, uh, to my earlier comments, uh, you know, the MPO does have funding, obviously. We'll go through another funding round uh, this winter. So we give away our, our service train station block grant funds every other year. And just to put things in perspective there too, uh, this winter uh, will be somewhere in the $8 million range uh, that you all will approve for uh, various projects, depending on what you all submit, your, your community submit. So there's also that funding stream that's available for this sort of thing. And, and when you take a look at that, you know, seven or $8 million every other year, it takes a pretty big chunk out of that uh, 50 plus million dollar project cost. So um, to that degree, this board does have some control as well over actually, you know, pushing the project through. But again, I guess the short answer, uh, Mayor, would just be to talk to your folks. And uh, like I say, it's, it's gonna take a champion uh, of some sort to push this forward. And I just, you know, th this is new, obviously we're just, presenting this tonight, but um, at some point in time, it'll take either one of the communities or the university uh, to really get behind this and say, this is something we want to push forward. Otherwise, it, otherwise it'll just, you know, it'll wither and it'll come back in a few more years and, and you know, we'll talk about it again, but uh, that's not a knock. It's just how these transportation projects work when they're this big. My, my particular thing is I just don't want the discussions to stop here. I'd like to at least have the handouts that were shown, PowerPoints, at least in the hand that we can give it to our council to go ahead and at least examine it and do some <clears throat> internal discussions. And then if this thing starts gradually moving along, then we can combine the communities into a major group to carry it through. Yeah, that, that sounds good. So what I'll do is, uh, with Cranick's permission, I will forward on the PowerPoint slide that was shared tonight to you all in a follow-up email. And then we will also make the uh, all three of the phases of the study available on the MPO website because it's pretty easy to find there. Is that agreeable with everybody? It is. It is. Uh, Terry, I had a couple of um, other questions to follow up here, and they kind of go in line with, with what our next steps should be because i agree that you're gonna we're gonna lose interest if we don't keep this thing rolling and if we don't um you know keep trying to gauge uh public interest in this all of us are representing our public but we're going to be asked questions uh, about this along the way um canton um um jeff as you presented this um information and you'll get those slides to us would you also be able to tell us a little bit more about how your ridership count was calculated and uh, some of those assumptions. It's um, you know casually a conversation that uh, we had as a, uh, it was an off, uh, offshoot conversation last night after a council meeting, was that the ridership number just seems extraordinary. And it's not that the number wasn't done, it's just my own education. And that's what's what we're going to have to represent to folks when we're trying to gain enthusiasm for a project like this. So if, if further detail on how that number was arrived at could be provided to us, um, I, I really, I, I don't understand how that number uh, got in there. Um, the, the question on um, cost, and, and Kent, you made a very good point in relation to all of the other transportation projects that happen. Um, you know, this is, this is uh, much, much smaller. The difference with this one though, is that there's gonna be a lot of local money. And it's going to be up to all of us as individual cities and in our budgets to provide some money to that. Uh, and, and while we provide money to the Iowa Department of Transportation uh, indirectly, uh, we, not any of us individually, are on the hook for that I-380 um, and 80 intersection that's being constructed. So this is a direct swipe uh, into our budgets to pull this off. Um, and indirectly, you know, it's going to affect other parts of our budget as well. So there's going to have to be this justification. So one of the things that I'd like to see before we have a, a larger discussion with our um, with our audience up here in North Liberty is uh, what what are some estimates on the the cost per entity? Uh, where do we believe money is going to come from? And and you illustrated a good point there on eight million dollars uh, of monies that we'll decide on here um, coming up. 
if you can help us understand where these dollars may be coming from, and again, understanding that they're not, it's not going to be, you know, in, in stone that the city of North Liberty is going to be on the hook for X millions of dollars, but helping us to understand that, because that's part of the story we are going to have to tell, and part of the, the questions that we are most certainly going to be asked uh, as representatives of our individual cities. And I, I think I'll just kind of leave it there uh, for right now. Uh, I think um, having broader ridership hours uh, was, was an excellent uh, point. And, and lastly, I'll ask, you know, and I think this was part of the very first study that was done, while the, uh, the freight line between North Liberty and Iowa City really does, doesn't get used for freight too much, um, there is some traffic that can happen between the airport and uh, the city of North Liberty. So if this is a success and we're looking 10, 20 years down the road and there's an expansion, is there going to be an opportunity to um, utilize that rail between North Liberty and the airport uh, for passenger service? Or will there, because there, at some point in time, we have Centro here in North Liberty that is going to need freight. They're going to continue to be a freight user. How would that freight get in and out around the the need for uh, passenger rail uh, to be there. And I don't believe that'll be an issue now, but it would be an issue in the next phase that would go from North Liberty up to the airport. Thank so you. Chris, Chris, are you talking about the place where um, there have been rail cars sitting there for almost a year between North Liberty and the airport? Because I mean, even, even um, for Centro, they, they used to use that part and then they had that spur off to their property, but those cars have been sitting there for so long that I don't think that their, their um, access must be something different now. I, I'm not quite sure how they're getting their stuff because those, unless there's two, two railroads right next, next to each other. Yeah. But those cars are, are, have been there for ages. Yeah, I, I agree. Yeah. They've been there since, um, since about April or so. Um, and I, I thought longer. that they had, yeah, I know it does feel like longer. I think it's probably just a reflection of COVID and, and uh, the capacity. I don't know if it's something that's happening in Cedar Rapids with that project that they're doing up there. Um, but that, that's a great point. I mean, Centro is getting material right now somehow, uh, but it certainly can't be on any of these lines um, feeding us from the north. So uh, they're, they're coming, they're, they're getting it somehow. So understanding how that would still happen for Centro um, in this process would, would be a great answer. There are definitely options, Chris, for Centro, and I won't waste everybody's time with it on, you know, the dialogue, but they're still getting rail in today. Yes. Um, so um, it's coming from the south. Um, it's interesting, just as a side note, right now, uh, due to COVID and global energy markets, uh, the latest stat I saw is that 29% of the North American rail car fleet at the end of August was parked um, because, um, you know, things just aren't moving like they do in normal times. So it's certainly extraordinary. And that's why you've seen the extended uh, cars parked here and on frankly, every other rail site you can find in the upper Midwest and North America for that part. Well, so I think that's yeah. a good point there then, Jeff. And I'm glad you brought that up because if they're getting freight from the South, that's where this transit, um, that's where this commuter line, you know, would be, would be going. And if that's blocked, uh, and I guess you started to answer that, I apologize. Uh, you, you know, there would be a way for Central to get material. Um, yes, I, there I'll, is. I'll, I'll leave it at that. So thank you. Yeah. You bet. It, it, it's Tony Plama with HDR as well. And in many communities, uh, uh, there's something done that, that is done for operations that's called temporal separation, where you separate the freight operation at a certain time of day versus the passenger operation as well. And that works with the, the federal regulations. That way you're not um, disturbing one operation and you're ensuring that the safety of passengers is protected without an interface of freight during the day. And um, that can certainly happen in the future for everything going north to Cedar Rapids from North Liberty as well. Or if there had to be movement from the south, that, that could also be accommodated through that temporal separation. Just a method of operation. And, and Chris, this is Kevin Ralston speaking. Uh, with respect to your questions about, you know, who who's going to fund what and how, um, it's certainly not lost on me or any of the other folks that worked on the study that uh, now is a hard time with COVID. And I know you're all uh, looking at your budgets here coming up uh, for the following year. And uh, I know it's going to be a difficult time. So the landing of this study was a little bit unfortunate in that way. Um, but it also gives us a little bit of time to think about it. And if you haven't had a chance to look at the uh, the third study, Chris, it does talk quite a bit about where some of those different funding opportunities are. 
Uh, now with the local breakdown of the five or so million dollars that are uh, the spread, so to speak, um, you know, we could we could cut that up a, a lot of different ways, but or actually, excuse me, it's about two and a half million dollars. Um, we could cut that up a lot of different ways, but again, with so many different entities involved, it really breaks that number down to, you know, something a little more palatable. But yeah, it's certainly not lost on me that budget times are going to be tough for everyone right now for a number of years. And so this is Tony Plumman again with HDR. Uh, Chris, uh, with respect to the, the ridership study we did, uh, in the final report that was released at the end of July, uh, section four actually highlights a lot of that information you're probably looking for. And uh, we used a pretty prescriptive process from the Federal Transportation Administration. Uh, it's a stops model, uh, relies on uh, very static inputs. Um, a lot of that are developed within this region uh, and, and location. And then we supplemented that with an onboard survey study for the student market. Um, we, we did a sensitivity analysis that kind of looked at, you know, what would happen if we changed different factors. Um, the FTA has a prescriptive process that says if it's commuter operation, you're going to use this factor. If, uh, you know, for your, your vehicle movement, you're going to use this factor. So we looked at changing those factors to see what would happen in, in where, where it landed with the different ridership um, that's annualized per day. So uh, I think it's documented pretty well. We certainly could field some questions. Um, should you need need uh, some more questions addressed on that, just let us know. That's great. I appreciate that, guys. And, and to this group, if there's a report that I have missed and I haven't had a chance to study before this overview, uh, I apologize for taking up this time here. Uh, it seems like I may have not seen this report and, and could have been better prepared for those those questions. No, no, that's fine. The, the, the report is long and we'll make sure it gets out. But um, you know, to Tony's answer just then too, Chris, the, and for everyone's benefit, the model they used and the survey they produced was, uh, was around $100,000. I mean, it was a really prescriptive study. And what they actually use in their modeling is very similar to what we house here in the MPO with respect to our travel demand model. Um, so basically they, and, and we had shown that video to you, I believe at your last board meeting about what it is that we do for our long range planning efforts. So the model they use is very similar um, for a different purpose, obviously, but it's very similar to that. So that'd be a, uh, akin to the process we go through as well. This is Megan. I just have a, a quick question. And again, I may have missed this in one of the reports, but um, is there any information about the potential impact on the um, uh, bus service in the different uh, entities. Um, one of the questions I had, again, and I'll take a look at the information about the how the ridership numbers were determined, um, is that we are seeing a decrease in the, the ridership on our transit. So I was just curious um, if there was any information about the potential impact that this could have on that. Yeah, Megan, there, there is some information on that. It's pretty high level, um, but there are certainly some routes that would be impacted and potentially able to be uh, either reduced or eliminated. And several of the, the important ones, I think, Aaron Shane from the university, I don't think was able to make the meeting tonight, uh, but there are several routes uh, that Canvas run to Oakdale, the Oakdale campus, that she had mentioned at one point in time that you know they'd have to take a hard look at whether those would actually be necessary anymore. So certainly there would be an impact on uh, at least some transit routes. Um, but your point is well taken as well that with the COVID, you know, transit numbers are really, really down right now. Uh, so again, maybe not the best time to launch a uh, passenger rail study, or excuse me, passenger rail, uh, but maybe it is, you know, this will all end at some point in time. Um, so it, this obviously isn't something that happens overnight. So by the time we gear up, hopefully uh, we'll all be well enough to ride passenger rail. This is Laura Burgess from Iowa City. Um, just to kind of piggyback on what Megan was asking, you know, Iowa City, Coralville, and Canvas bus, you know, transit services are all in this study. And I think at our next city council meeting for Iowa City, we're going to get an overview from the consultant. But is there any way to coordinate the the study or the information? Like, because from a financial standpoint, you know, Iowa City and what it what it commits currently to transit and looking at diverting some of that depending on the routes and the ridership and where things are. I mean, I know that's maybe a stupid question, but can we just make sure that there's some communication happening there? Or what's the best way to make sure that that happens? 
Right, so no, that's a really good question. And all three of the transit managers, uh, Coralville, Iowa City, and Canvas are all aware that the passenger rights were taking place. Um, I think for them, it's a little bit hard to, um, it's really hard to plan, I think, for making changes that, you know, may or may not occur, of course, with passenger rail. And even if they were to occur, you know, maybe occur five years from now, uh, just because that might be the amount of time it takes to even get something like this up and running. I, I don't know that to be true, but it, it certainly isn't going to happen overnight. So um, I don't have a good answer for you, Laura, other than that they are aware of the, the potential for the service. And, and I, you know, and I think if in five years this is up and running, I, I'm quite sure that they, they can cut some routes or adjust, you know, on the fly as needed. Yes, we need to move ahead. So any final questions or comments? Just want to thank everybody for their time this evening. You bet. Yeah. Yeah, I want to thank Jeff and, and Tony and Amanda for all joining us. And uh, they're always, uh, they've always been great to work with and they're always available for questions. So those can be funneled through me and we can, of course, get any answers that the group needs. Thank you for having us. Thank you, Ken. Thank you. Next on our agenda is the public hearing consideration of amendment to the adopted fiscal year 2021 through 24. MPOJC Transportation Improvement Program, modifying programs with Interstate uh, 80 and 380 interchange construction funds. Yeah. Uh, can you just yeah. tell us how and the why? Yes. So as many of you are aware, uh, the Transportation Improvement Program is the programming document for all surface transportation projects that receive state or federal funds, including street, highway, transit, rail, uh, bicycle and pedestrian. Uh, the MPO submits the TIP annually to the Iowa Department of Transportation to document the status of local transportation projects uh, using those state and federal funds. And to utilize those funds, project must be included in the TIP uh, with an accurate scope and identified funding sources. Uh, with no exception to that, the DOT also has to have their projects uh, that are in our urbanized area included in our TIP. And the Iowa DOT has requested an amendment to the adopted 21 to 24 TIP, uh, which you all approved just this past July, uh, increasing the funding amount in federal physical 21 for the I-80, I-380 interchange project. Uh, the change in funding is due to the Iowa DOT delaying a project letting uh, from this summer to this winter. So in essence, uh, there was a big bid letting package that we had, had, they had intended to send out this summer that will instead be sent out this winter. Because of that, uh, as shown in your memo, uh, the total project funding for uh, FFY21 is about $137 million uh, and change. And the new project funding amount for 21 is uh, about $207 million and change. Um, so again, it's not that the project cost has gone up, it's really just moving uh, the funding into the appropriate federal fiscal year in our TIP. Uh, staff is requesting approval of the proposed amendment and the Transportation Technical Advisory Committee unanimously recommended approval at their meeting uh, just last week. And with that, I'll ask the chair to open the public hearing and uh, see if there's any public comment. And if not, uh, after it's closed, I'd be happy to answer any questions uh, that you all might have. Okay, now's the time for a public hearing in regards to said amendment. Anyone wishing to speak in regards to this? Please chime in. Hearing no comment, call the public hearing to a close. This will be an amendment to adopt the fiscal 21 to 24 plan modifying the program on I 380 380. Anyone wish to establish that amendment? So move, John Thomas. Thank second, you, Chris second. Hoffman. Yes, Terry, I second that. Okay, thank you very much. Any final discussion or questions? All in favor, thumbs up or thumbs down. Thumbs up or in favor. Can't see your thumb, there you go, kid. I'll vote it aye. Motion passes as.
Thank you. Council's discussion regarding the amendments to the proposed NPOJC bylaws. Kent, that's yours again. Yes, thank you. Uh, per the adopted NPOJC bylaws, uh, the bylaws are to be reviewed every five years at a minimum by a committee of five representatives, uh, which then make a recommendation to this board. Uh, four representatives uh, from the Urban Policy Board and one from the Rural Policy Board. Uh, amendments to the bylaws must be approved by a two-thirds majority vote by the Urban Board and by a simple vote uh, by the Rural Board. Uh, last winter, the Urban and, and both the Urban and Rural Policy Boards appointed the following members to sit on the committee. Uh, the Mayor of North Liberty, Terry Donahue, uh, University Heights Mayor, Louise Fromm, uh, Coralville City Council Member, Megan Foster, uh, Johnson County Board of Supervisors, Pat Hyden, and then our rural uh, member was Christopher Taylor, who is the mayor of Swisher. Uh, the goal of the committee was to review the bylaws in their entirety, as I mentioned. Uh, the committee was also tasked specifically to review the bylaws stipulating how appointments are made to the East Central Iowa Council of Governments, and also to discuss the necessity of the Rural Policy Board and whether or not that uh, board is, is essentially needed any longer. The bylaws committee met back in June and I have attached uh, the meeting agenda and staff notes for your review in your packet. I also included uh, draft redlined bylaws uh, that would reflect the general recommendations from the committee. Uh, and those recommendations are as follows. And several of the committee members are on the uh, call tonight, so feel free to chime in uh, if you feel so inclined. Uh, the first recommendation from the committee was that the Johnson County Board of Supervisors should appoint the citizen representative to the ECCOG board with no term limit. Uh, and the position then would no longer be advertised by the MPO. So the way it works currently, uh, most of you will remember, is every winter we come to you uh, after, well, we come to you and ask if we should either reappoint the current citizen representative or advertise for a new representative. And Randy Lobsher uh, has been our citizen appointment for, well, he's in his second term now. Uh, what the recommendation is for is to use a more strategic appointment, and this is sort of a, um, a term that the ECCOG uh, director, Karen Kurt, has provided me, where some of the other counties that are represented by ECCOG are using a more strategic appointment, they call it, where they're essentially either sending a staff member or a member of the community that might have a little bit more uh, background in, say, uh, economic development, for instance, uh, or something else that the ECCOG board might be looking at. Uh, I did talk to Randy Lobsher about this, uh, boy, probably six months ago now or so, and it's certainly not a knock uh, for anything Randy's done, and, and he appreciated that, but um, he even mentioned that sometimes it's, it's a little bit confusing as to what his job is and what his charge is as the citizen appointment. Um, so um, the committee felt, and I felt as well, that it makes a little bit more sense just to let the county appoint uh, someone to the ECCOG board. Um, the second recommendation was that the Board of Supervisors would have one permanent representative on the ECCOG board uh, with the remaining two appointments on rotation from the five urbanized area communities. So Iowa City, Coralville, North Liberty, Tiffin, and University Heights, uh, and that rural communities would no longer be in the rotation. <coughs> Excuse me. And while this sounds, uh, this sounds sort of uh, abrupt, really the way it works now, if you recall, is that the largest two entities being, by population, being the county and Iowa City rotate an appointment every other year. Then the third through fifth largest rotate every third year. That's North Liberty, Coralville, and the city of Solon. And then the remaining seven smallest Johnson County communities rotate every seventh year. So while it sounds sort of abrupt to not allow uh, the smaller communities to have a place anymore, they were only able to represent their community once every seven years anyway. So I'm not sure that they were necessarily getting the best, uh, uh, the best time on the ECGOG board anyway. And then the next recommendation is that the term limits for the board appointments should be increased from one to two years, uh, which is something that the director of ECGOG has also uh, been supportive of. Um, this has come up several times where by the time you get your feet wet, say you're one of the small communities, you're only there every seven years as part of the rotation. Uh, by the time you get your feet wet, you're basically off the board again for another seven years. So you can see there's some, some, some inefficiency there, uh, I'll say that. 
Uh, and then the last uh, recommendation is that the MPO JC Rural Policy Board should be eliminated and that Johnson County should absorb the balance of the rural budget assessment starting uh, in FY22, which is estimated to be about $6,500. Uh, staff would continue to solicit for work program projects from the small communities and continue to provide the same service as currently offered. Uh, and again, this sounds sort of scary and, and bureaucratic, but for about the last 10 years or so, um, the Rural Policy Board has only met once a year, essentially to approve uh, their budget, which albeit is pretty small. Um, and mostly it's just to give updates. And over the last 10 years or so, it's become increasingly hard to get a quorum at that meeting. Again, because uh, since we meet once a year and the mayors of small communities change sometime rather often, I'm not even sure if some of the small communities know who the representative is by the time we get around to our, our January meeting. So again, sounds a little scary, but as long as we're providing the same service, um, I don't see that being a, a huge issue. Uh, I did, I've mentioned this, but I did talk to Karen Kurt, the ECOG director, uh, about all these items, and she did, she did have some concern about removing the small communities from the rotation because that's who they primarily help. However, uh, I did explain that if we, if we move to a two-year term limit, or a two-year term, excuse me, uh, which she supported, that would make their rotation uh, once every 14 years, which is longer than most of us will uh, be in our position. So she did understand that. And uh, Pat Hyden, who is on the bylaws committee, did mention that the Board of Supervisors, are, and Lisa Green Douglas is on the, the call tonight, uh, they represent, they sort of um, are assigned to small communities is my understanding. Uh, and so they have a, a, a liaison through the Board of Supervisors. And Pat had mentioned at our, our bylaws committee meetings that she felt pretty comfortable uh, that they'd be able to take the message from the small community, uh, whether it's to support a grant application or, a, or funding of a grant application, that they'd be able to take that to the board and uh, honestly probably get better representation than they do now. Um, what I'd like from the board is that you discuss this item and provide staff with direction. Uh, I know it's a lot to chew on. Uh, if the board agrees with these recommendations, uh, what I need to do is schedule a special meeting with the Rural Policy Board. Uh, both, both boards require 30 days notice uh, to make any changes to the bylaws. Uh, so I will need to have a special meeting with the Rural Board and then bring this back to you all, assuming that they support these recommendations. Uh, I need to bring this back to you all in November for a final vote uh, so we can start to prepare the budgets accordingly because this would have some, some budget impl implications. So with that, I'm happy to answer any questions you have. And as I mentioned, we've got a few members uh, from the bylaws committee, I believe on the call tonight. So uh, we can try and, and do our best to answer your questions. Anything on there that you have questions about or suggestions about? This is Pauline from Iowa City. Uh, no questions or concerns. Uh, just a note on thank you to the bylaws committee for, for looking into this and, and doing this work. Uh, but on, on the list of the bylaws members, uh, Pat Hyden's name actually was misspelled. It's P A Y. So there's a typo there. So it should be P A T. Just, just a little. I caught that, Pauline. Thank you. It's something okay. the spell check doesn't uh, fix, apparently, if it's still a real word. So I apologize to, to Pat for that. Thank you. Yeah, yeah it's a real word. Okay. But then just a note again, uh, as you've mentioned, Kent, Kent uh, I, I definitely agree with the change in the term from one year to two year, because having served on that committee uh, a few years back, I mean, you barely get an understanding of what's going on, and, and especially all the abbreviations that are used. That's, that's really hard to keep track of that and, and what they're talking about. So I'm very much in favor of, of the two-year uh, limit rather than the one year. Other comments, requested changes? Yeah, this is Janice Weiner. I would agree with, with Pauline. Um, one year, it definitely is too short if one is to be an effective member, especially since there are a number of members from other places who have been on for multiple years and have a lot of institutional background. Uh, my only question is, have there were some notes in the minutes that, that you all really needed to consult with Chris Taylor and didn't know if you'd had a chance to do that, though this all makes really good sense to me. Yeah, I did, I did have some email exchanges with Chris Taylor uh, early on. And to be honest, uh, 
when we got closer to this meeting, I sort of sent out a, a note to the bylaws committee saying, okay, this is what we're moving forward with. Um, and I did not hear back from Chris, so I assume that this is, this is something that he supports, Janice. But having said that, um, I do need to take this and, and schedule that special meeting with them. So they'll certainly get another crack at this. And, and the rural board may, um, they may not like this. I don't know how they'll respond, but I do think uh, that this is probably the right step forward. So, so at any rate, the rural policy board may come back and say, no, we, we don't want to dissolve. Uh, we don't want to make these changes. And in that case, uh, we'll have to sort of circle our horses, so to speak, and, and figure out how to move forward. There's, there's certainly nothing broken right now about what's happening. I think we're just making tweaks to try and make things better. So we could certainly move forward uh, the way we are now. Um, but like, like Janice, you've mentioned and others, Pauline, um, it just doesn't seem to be the right fit right now. So hopefully the rural board will see that. And uh, so long as they're getting the same service, which they would be, or probably even better service, uh, with respect to representation, I think it's something that if I articulate it well, I, I assume they will support. Any final comments? Go ahead and take your next step, Ken. Okay, thank you very much. Next item, discussion regarding the Service Transportation Block Grant, STBG and Transportation Alternative Grants. Emily, I think this is yours. Yes, good evening, everyone. Emily Bothell, Senior Associate Transportation Planner. Um, as Kent had mentioned earlier, MPO grant applications for Surface Transportation Block Grant and Transportation Alternative Program funding will be available in February of next year. And prior to that, we wanted to provide the board an opportunity to review the attached STBG and TAP scoring criteria which was revised and approved in November 2018. Um, at that time, we did make a few minor modifications as requested by the Transportation Technical Advisory Committee and the board, um, but overall the function remained the same. Um, keep in mind that the same criteria is also used to score and rank transportation projects to be included in the fiscally constrained list of the long range transportation plan. And last week, the Transportation Technical Advisory Committee um, supported the continued use of the criteria. And so today, um, we're asking the board to share any recommended revisions that you may have. Um, and ultimately, we'll be looking for approval of the criteria at your November meeting. Um, but we did want to give you guys um, some time to discuss and um, revise if necessary. So if there are any comments or questions about the criteria, we would love to hear those. Yeah, I would just I would just mention quickly. Um, you know, this is something we bring back to you every other year before our our funding cycle, which is no different than this year. Um, the technical advisory committee certainly supported this, as Emily mentioned, um, and staff also supports what we've got in place. It's not not to say we can't make changes if the board feels necessary, um, but I do think that it's with some tweaks we've made in years past, it's working pretty well. I think folks are getting the funding they need for their projects when they need it. Um, but with that, we, we're, we're certainly happy to entertain any, any tweaks that need to be made. Uh, I, had, I did have one comment, Kent, and that, that had to do with um, the criteria under environment. Uh, in looking at that, it, it refers to preserving and protecting our natural resources, including land, water, and air quality. And uh, in looking at the criteria, they're primarily focused on air quality. And so I was looking also at the, um, you know, what we'll be looking at a little bit later in the agenda with the MPO long range transportation plan. And, you know, it has some of the same guiding principles. I think they're identical, if I'm not mistaken, or close to it. In any event, there is one under environment and it includes the VMT, which we have, but it also talks about housing density, which I think, refer, in my mind, is uh, reflective of the question of land. And, and then we might wanna consider adding one related to water. So it could be, for example, stormwater management, something along those lines that could also be incorporated. So that we, we try to address all three aspects of what's described as, as the environment that we're trying to preserve and protect. 
Yeah, I appreciate that. Um, we do have a, for housing density in, let's see, what would it be? Um, which one is that? In quality of life, yeah, I guess it's, it's the third criteria. Um, we do give some extra points for um, multifamily developments and that sort of thing. So there is, we do get at the density uh, criteria, I guess, just a little bit, John. Um, yeah, I think your stormwater uh, point is well taken. Uh, certainly projects that use federal funding have to still go through the, uh, the proper NEPA process and so on and so forth. But for, for scoring, we'll have to give that a little bit of thought, John. I'm not sure. Most of the time, transportation projects don't have to, um, they don't have to ameliorate stormwater issues. So we just have to think a little bit about how we want to, how we could tackle that. I, I did I did check Des Moines. They have some reference to uh, water quality in their criteria. I don't remember if they talked about land use, but it, it does seem to me, and it sort of speaks to our rail conversation at Crandick, you know, an important potential aspect of that project is the land use development that um, would would be incentivized by it. And, you know, when we're talking about environment, I think how we our land planning piece, which I think is perhaps not emphasized enough at MPO, which tends to be more about the transportation aspect and not so much the land. Um, it seemed like that might be something to, to give more emphasis to. Yeah, the one, the one thing that comes to mind, I guess, now that I think about it just a minute, is uh, you know, if there are storm water management features within your project, I suppose that would be an easy one to get uh, an additional point for, um, right? If that's something you would support, and if yeah. if the board supports it, that's an easy enough one for us to add. Okay. Uh, just adding a point to the environment criteria where you get a, a total possible of five points, and you would get an additional point for stormwater management, I guess, uh, solutions, so to speak. Which could inc include things like street trees. You know, as a, you know, they have a stormwater benefit at least in terms of the initial precipitation. No, those are, those are good points. Thanks, John. Any other comments? Hearing none, discussion regarding potential federal functional classification changes for urbanized area roadways. Emily, your show again. Thank you. Um, as I mentioned earlier, grant applications will be due in February of 21. Um, and the funding um, for STBG and TAP can only be spent on roadways that are functionally classified as collector or higher. Um, and so we've asked the Transportation Technical Advisory Committee, um, which is comprised of staff from your respective entities, to review the current federal functional classification map and submit any needed revisions before um, October 15. Um, the FFC map characterizes all roadways in the Metro that are eligible to receive federal funding. And if a community would like to revise the map, um, say add a new road or amend an existing road that is on the map, um, now would be the time to do that. That being said, any roadways that are requested do need to have a high level of connectivity across the Metro. Um, roadways that do not show a high level of connectivity or new roadways that are not in the community's capital improvement program will not be approved by the Iowa DOT. Um, we have about a 35% limit on the percentage of total road mileage that can be included on the system. And currently we're at about 32%. And so that leaves us with about 13.5 miles um, that can be classified. And so once we have received all amendments from staff, we will work with the Iowa DOT to get pre-approval. Once we get pre-approval, we will then bring a recommendation back to the committee and the board for final approval in, in advance of the, um, the scoring um, and the allocation of funding next year. Are there any questions about the process or federal functional classification in general? It's exciting stuff, we know. <laughs> okay, hearing no comment, move on. Update and initial discussion of the 
MPLJC Long Range Transportation Plan Revision Process. Emily. So as mentioned at your July meeting, we are currently um, working to update our Long Range Transportation Plan. Um, the plan will be a culmination of a multi-year planning process, and this year we are um, aiming to update the content, um, and we plan to keep the framework as the last plan um, because that plan structure is very user-friendly. Um, and um, last time we did a wholesale revision of the entire um, plan. Um, to keep the board informed of our long-range planning undertakings, I did detail a list of items for discussion and general concurrence. Um, this plan builds on the previous plan's vision, guiding principles, and performance measures, which are listed in your memo. Um, the transportation vision was crafted in 2017, and we believe it is still representative of what um, we envision for the future transportation network. Um, we also believe it complements our guiding principles nicely. Um, the guiding principles, um, there are nine of them, which are shown in your memo, can be viewed as the plan's goals. They establish the plan's foundation and are directly tied to the scoring criteria that we um, talked about today and um, the plan's performance measures. So we'll be asking the board to approve the guiding principles at your November meeting. And then moving on to the performance measures, we are required to include performance measures in our plan and attached is a list of those measures that will help us um, evaluate how well the regional system is performing as compared to those 2017 baseline goals. Um, we intend to continue tracking all measures that are listed and there are a few new measures that are now required by the Federal Highway Administration. Um, so with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have today about um, the vision, guiding principles, or the performance measures. Questions or comments? Yeah, Emily had mentioned, uh, you know, that this, well, we mentioned at our last meeting, and Emily alluded to this, that we don't see this as a full uh, a revision, I guess, uh, as we have in past years. Um, we see it as more of kind of an update. So um, unless the board sees any major issues with uh, some of the measures that we'll be uh, looking at, the vision, the principles, um, you know, unless there's any major departure from that, we'll be, we'll be using this as the guidelines again to create the report or the plan, excuse me. Um, and as we mentioned in the past, the DOT and the FHWA are really, uh, they were really impressed with our last plan. So having said that, you know, unless there's any major changes, we'll just be using this as sort of the framework to move forward with. Are you folks okay with that? Yep, affirmative head shake. Very good. Thank you. Emily, thank you for the last three. Yes. Uh, any other business for you folk? If not, a motion to adjourn. Taylor, so moved. Okay, Hoffman, state. second. Yeah. Second by Chris Hoffman. All those oh. say aye. 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 Motion carries. Good night. Go home. Enjoy yourself. Thank you so much, everyone. We appreciate your time. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Ken. All right, Thank thanks. You. Thanks, everybody. Good night.